Good morning, Kilat Alexion, and good morning to members of the United Synagogue and friends of the United Synagogue uh, who are indisposed and unable to join us in person for the Siyum today to mark the Tanit Bechorin, the fast of the firstborn, and to allow those who are firstborns to uh, eat today so that they will be able to be in good spirits for the Seder this evening and to take care of all the preparations that no doubt many of us have to take care of today. Today's uh, Siyum is a Siyum on the Seder of Mishnah, the second Seder of the six uh, Sadari of the Mishnah, Seder Moed, and we're going to be concluding the final Mishnah in Masechet Chagiga. Masechet Chagiga is an interesting uh, Masechet to uh, conclude with because Seder Moed in general deals with all the uh, practical halachot uh, associated with uh, the Chagim, with uh, Pesach and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, those that apply to nowadays, that apply nowadays, those that applied in the times of the Beit HaMikdash. Masechet Chagiga is uh, totally about uh, how the uh, Chagim were observed in the times of the Beit HaMikdash, and in particular the Korbanot, the special sacrifices that had to be brought to the temple on uh, the festivals. And it's important for us to remember that uh, we think about uh, our nice Yom Tovim uh, here at our homes in, uh, in London or wherever we might be, but a big part of what uh, Yom Tov celebration is really supposed to be about is missing. We're missing the opportunity to uh, to eat the korbanot in Yerushalayim. And Masech uh, Chagiga deals in part with, uh, with that. Now, shuls are very often uh, very full over the, uh, the Chagim, and Kavachome, that was the case in Yerushalayim with the Beit HaMikdash. Everybody was piling into the Beit HaMikdash to bring their Korbanot and to fulfill the mitzvah of Re'iyah, the mitzvah of appearing in the Beit HaMikdash. In principle, you're supposed to be Tahol when you enter the Beit HaMikdash. You're supposed to be ritually pure. Uh, there was no way of policing that. And uh, undoubtedly, uh, people who were Tumayim, people who were ritually impure, did come into the, uh, the Beit HaMikdash. And uh, after Yom Tov, so on Yom Tov itself and on Cholam they didn't worry about that. It's called Dichvin Yete Biechol. Anybody who wanted to come was welcome to come and come into the Beit HaMikdash. And we didn't suspect anybody of not being ritually pure. However, after Yom Tov, they needed not only to sweep the floors and clear up, uh, clear up the, the mess and no doubt remove the portaloos as well, but uh, they also had to uh, make sure that uh, the Beit HaMikdash was restored to its uh, situation of ritual purity. And the final uh, Mishnah deals with uh, how the Kalim, how the utensils in the Beit HaMikdash were immersed for that, uh, for that purpose. And the Mishnah says, So how did they uh, make sure that the Azara, the temple courtyard, was uh, ritually pure so that the Avodah could continue there as usual uh, after the festival? So all the Kalim, all the vessels that were in the Beit HaMikdash, they would take and immerse them in a mikvah. For Omrim Lahem, and they would tell all the pilgrims who come to Yerushalayim, they would say, Be careful not to touch the shulchan, the table which had the lechem apanim, the showbread on it, because we don't, that can't be removed from its place and it can't be immersed in a mikvah. Likewise, the menorah couldn't be uh, removed from its place and couldn't be immersed uh, in, a, in a mikvah. And therefore, they had to be particularly careful that those uh, kalim, those utensils, didn't become uh, ritually impure because there was no way of uh, purifying them. So they would warn everybody, yeah, you're welcome to crowd into the azara, but please don't come into contact with the shulchan or the menorah. And there were always spares in the Beit HaMikdash, all the various, uh, the kalim, the bowls and the, uh, the shovels and the, the, all the, the knives and all the various implements, they had, uh, they had spares. Why did they have spares? Uh, so if the first ones became tame, then they could bring the second ones in their place. And all the kalim, as we said, need to be immersed with the exception of the two Mizbachos, with the exception of the uh, the altars, the golden altar and the copper altar. Now, why did they not uh, get immersed? The Tanakhama says, because they have the status, even though 
they weren't made out of earth. Nevertheless, they had the status of being uh, being made out of earth. The uh, the 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 mizbech and the choshet, the copper mizbech, actually did have earth as part of its construction. And even though it was also a copper, nevertheless, it was regarded as essentially being made out of earth. Something made out of earth doesn't become tamay. Uh, can't contract ritual impurity, and therefore you don't need to worry about it. The Mizbach HaZahav, the golden altar, was compared to the Mizbach HaNechoshet, to the copper altar, and therefore that also uh, didn't need uh, didn't need immersion in a mikvah. Divrei Rabbi Eliezer. So that's the view of Rabbi Eliezer, the Tanakhama. However, the Chachamim, or the Chachamim say, Mipnei Shehein Mutsupin, because they are overlaid. So there's a machloket here, a dispute in the uh, in the Mepharshim, in the commentators, what this uh, what this means, whether it means that in actual fact, because they were con- uh, covered with either gold or with copper, then in actual fact, they did need to be immersed in a mikvah, and that uh, the Chachamim are arguing against Rabbi Eliezer, or whether it means that even though they were uh, they were covered, nevertheless the covering was only a very small part of the Mizbah of the altar, and therefore it was negligible, and therefore they didn't need to be immersed in a mikvah because they didn't contract Tumah, and uh, therefore the Chachamim are not arguing against, against Rabbi Eliezer, and that's the view of the Rambam in his uh, commentary to the Mishnah. So we have a machloket there in the uh, in the Mepharshim, how to understand that final line uh, in the Mishnah. Next time we learn through uh, uh, Seder Moed, we'll be able to think about that in uh, in more detail. But we say Nishlama Masechet Chagiga. We've now concluded Masechet Chagiga. And indeed, over the course of the past year, I've been learning the whole of Seder Moed. So it's not just uh, Masechet Chagiga, which has been concluded, but it's also Seder Moed, Hadaran Anach Seder Moed, Hadaran Halan. So now we say the, the Hadran, uh, saying that we've been uh, enlightened and enriched by learning Seder Moed, and we hope to come back and learn it again. Datan Anach Seder Moed, Datan Halan, Lord, in Shemin Ach Seder Moed, Lord, in Shemin Ach, Lord, in Shemin Ach, Lord, in and now we pray that just we've been able to learn to say their mind and be enriched by it, we should be able to learn other Sadar and many other uh, Safarim and spend our time uh, learning Torah and uh, becoming uplifted and written, enriched and closer to our Kaddish Baruch in that way. And then we'll conclude with the Kaddish.
Everybody who's here with us in person is welcome to join us uh, for a uh, biscuit in the uh, foyer. Biscuits are biscuits are shahar kol, not the zonot. Everybody who's not with us and everybody who is with us, we wish you all kad kasher, sameach, have a wonderful yomta.